Hi everyone! Today I decided to show you some interesting electronic components that many of you may have never even heard of. It's important to note that I won't be showing individual rare or unique radio parts. Instead, we'll look at entire families of components, using specific examples. These include both specialized components and ones that used to be quite common, but are now outdated. Let's not beat around the bush and dive straight into a little journey into the past. I hope you'll find it interesting. Electromagnetic relays come in a wide variety of types. Here you see a relatively compact relay in a plastic case, the RPK-21. This relay isn't ordinary, it's a polarized one. The unique feature of these relays is that they have two stable states, regardless of whether there's current in the control coil. A polarized relay has two windings. It's also called a memory relay. A regular relay needs a constant current supplied to its coil to operate, but a polarized relay only requires a short pulse to one winding to switch, and it will stay in that state until a pulse is sent to the other coil. In other words, it works like a flip-flop, and this is probably thanks to the magnets inside. These relays used to be widely used in telephony, relay logic, railway automation, as well as in various switches and remote control systems. Despite advances in electronics and the emergence of powerful solid-state switches, such relays are still rarely, but occasionally, used in industry. And it's all thanks to the fact that it can remember its state, even when it's powered off. In the first half of the last century, all electronics were based on vacuum tubes. These monstrous beauties were used everywhere, even for rectifying current. There were no diode rectifiers back then. In particular, Kenetron rectifiers were widely used. In the 1930s and 1940s, the first mass-produced semiconductor selenium rectifiers appeared. They had several advantages, no need for a heater, higher efficiency and lifespan, and they were less fragile compared to glass tubes. A selenium rectifier typically consists of an aluminum plate, which serves as both the substrate and the heat sink. A thin layer of selenium is applied to this plate, and on top of it, an intermediate oxide layer is added to ensure one-way conductivity. Next comes a front coating to improve contact. The reverse voltage of each such plate is 20 to 40 volts. To obtain a higher voltage rectifier, the plates are connected in series. Selenium rectifiers have a number of drawbacks compared to modern diode ones. First of all, they have a rather large voltage drop, bulky size, and weight. Selenium rectifiers are also prone to aging. Over time, their parameters deteriorate, the voltage drop increases, and efficiency decreases. Nowadays, selenium rectifiers have been completely replaced by diode ones. Selenium rectifiers have one interesting feature, they are self-healing. If it experiences an overload in current or voltage and partially fails, after cooling down, the rectifier can fully restore its functions. Since we're talking about rectifiers, let me show you another one. Meet the Ignitron rectifier, or simply Ignitron. It has a mercury cathode. Yes, that's mercury. And there's a lot of mercury in here. It's controlled by an arc discharge. The liquid mercury cathode is located at the bottom of the tube. Near the top is the igniting electrode, often made of boron carbide, and at the very top is the anode. During operation, the tube is constantly cooled with water. To operate, a short current pulse is applied to the igniting electrode, causing the mercury near the igniting electrode to evaporate and create local ionization in that area. These vapors sharply reduce resistance, which leads to the formation of an arc discharge between the cathode and the anode. In an alternating current circuit, at the end of the cycle the voltage drops to zero, which causes the arc to extinguish. For the next half cycle, the process repeats. Ignitron rectifiers have a fairly high efficiency, ideally up to 98 or 99 percent. But even so, diode rectifiers are more efficient at high voltages. An ignitron requires a powerful ignition source to operate, while semiconductor diodes do not. Moreover, the latter are completely solid state. Drawbacks It is sensitive to installation, the anode must always be on top, it contains a large amount of mercury, so if the glass envelope breaks, there is a serious risk of mercury poisoning to the environment and people from both the mercury and its vapors. It is also sensitive to ambient temperature and vibrations. Since it has a mercury cathode, vibrations can cause the mercury to splash and end up where it shouldn't, creating current bridges or causing premature ignition. 
Also, fluctuations on the surface of the Mercury can cause the arc to become unstable, which leads to changes in current and, overall, to unstable operation of the ignitron. Ignitron rectifiers were used in electric locomotives, traction substations, and heavy industry to rectify currents from hundreds to thousands and even tens of thousands of amperes. In modern times, they have been almost completely replaced by diode rectifiers. Nowadays, ignitrons are often found at junkyards. If you come across one, pay attention to the tube. If it is broken, it means the area is contaminated with mercury. Never break intact ignitrons under any circumstances. It's better to dispose of them at specialized collection points for mercury-containing waste. I think all of you are familiar with thyristors. They come in different types, regular or optical, with galvanically isolated control. But I think not everyone has seen these kinds of thyristors. This is a photothyristor. It doesn't have the usual control lead, instead, it has a photosensitive area. If enough light enters this small window, the thyristor will activate. So, it's a completely contactless, light-controlled device. These things are convenient in automation systems where contactless control is needed, for example, with a fiber optic cable. They can be used in isolated high-voltage systems or in places with strong electromagnetic interference that could disrupt the operation of traditional control systems. They can also be used in security systems, alarms, and so on. Non-inductive resistors are a special class of resistors that either don't have wire inside, or the winding is done in a special way so that no noticeable inductance is formed. This is especially important for high-frequency operation, so that the resistor doesn't behave like an inductor. They come in several types, with specially wound wire, with a solid rod-shaped resistive layer, and film or metal film types. Right now, in front of you are not wire wound resistors, but TVO series resistors, thermal moisture resistant volumetric type. Made in the USSR. Power rating is 60 watts. Among non-inductive resistors, there are also ultra-stable ones. For example, these ones from Vichy, the Z-Foil series. These are used in metrological grade measuring equipment, where super high stability and accuracy are crucial. Similar resistors are often used by radio enthusiasts to build, for instance, a dummy load. Unfortunately, my resistors have the wrong resistance, and I haven't decided yet where I can use them. Photo Cell F41S There's actually nothing unusual about it, except for its design and the fact that it's selenium-based. I have a lot of these photo cells. A good friend gave them to me a while back. I have the original datasheet for it, but it contains very little useful information. The photosensitive element is selenium. Most likely for safety reasons, the datasheet states that the device contains bismuth, cadmium, tin, and lead. This sounds like the composition of a low-temperature solder, although that's not certain. But the composition is the same as wood's alloy. It has a low melting point, which makes sense since selenium is sensitive to high temperatures. Such a photo element is used in analog sensors, movie cameras, industrial scientific equipment, and so on. In today's world, they are outdated, since modern silicon counterparts have much higher efficiency, don't degrade as quickly, have a wider spectral range, and higher sensitivity. In addition, the solder contains cadmium and lead. Cadmium is one of the most toxic metals, even in small doses, especially when it comes to cadmium vapors. Probably not many people have heard about the next device. In front of you is a bolometer. In short, it's a radiation receiver, in this case, an optical one. The principle of the bolometer's operation is based on the change in resistance of a photosensitive element when it is heated by radiation falling on its surface. So, radiation hits the bolometer, this could be infrared or microwave, the temperature rises, and as a result, the resistance changes. Bolometers are sensitive to the entire spectrum of radiation. Due to its extremely high sensitivity, the bolometer is used in astronomy to detect the thermal radiation of stars and other celestial bodies. Bolometers of this type are often used in railway transport, where they are installed on stationary or mobile units to monitor the temperature of wheelset bearings. When a train passes through a checkpoint, the device records infrared radiation. If the temperature was high, an alarm would be triggered. The BP2 bolometer shown here is quite common. It has a hermetically sealed case with a lens made of polycrystalline silicon. 
The sensor housing also contains a preamplifier for the signal. It is designed to detect infrared radiation in the range from 6 to 20 micrometers, which is suitable for monitoring the heating of axle boxes. In addition to the main thermistor, there is also a compensating thermistor inside, which is shielded from infrared radiation. It is intended to compensate for the influence of ambient temperature. Bare transistors are a separate topic. These microscopic tiny devices were originally designed for use in various types of microassemblies. In other words, strictly for factory use, that's why they're not mass-produced. These samples from my personal collection are called KT354B2, and you can even find technical documentation for them. Apparently, these are ultra-high-frequency transistors, which I didn't expect. Their cutoff frequency is as high as 1.5 GHz. The power is tiny, 10, 30 milliwatts. The collector emitter voltage is only 10 volts. They're even hard to see with the naked eye. You can judge their size yourself compared to a match head. And the leads are practically invisible. This little marvel weighs just 0.003 grams. According to the datasheet, they're intended for use in RF and microwave amplifiers. Basically, with these you can make really tiny transmitters and amplifiers. By the way, they contain a minuscule amount of gold and palladium. Just this much. A tunnel diode is a very specific type of diode and is rarely used. I'll try to explain what a tunnel diode is in the simplest terms possible. A regular diode has a PN junction. Electrons pass through this junction if you accelerate them, meaning if you apply enough forward voltage to the diode. A tunnel diode also has a PN junction like that. Both regions are heavily doped, meaning there are a lot of impurities, which makes the barrier very thin. Quantum mechanics allows electrons to seep through this barrier. This is the effect of quantum tunneling. A tunnel diode starts conducting current at very low voltages, starting from as little as 0.05 to 0.3 volts. On the current voltage characteristic of a tunnel diode, you can see a region with negative differential resistance, which is caused by the tunneling effect. In a regular diode, and not just in diodes, as the voltage increases, the current flowing through it also increases. In the tunnel diode, however, it's clearly visible how, at first, the current naturally increases as the voltage rises, but then, as you continue to increase the voltage, you can notice a dip or a sharp drop in current. After that, the current starts to increase again, but now it's due to the usual injection of charge carriers. The drop happens because, as the voltage increases, the energy levels of the P and N regions start to overlap, tunneling becomes less effective, and the current decreases. By using the negative resistance region, you can build high-frequency and microwave generators based on tunnel diodes. Yes, an oscillator not on a transistor, but on a diode. In the past, tunnel diodes were among the fastest semiconductor devices, capable of operating at frequencies of tens or even hundreds of gigahertz. Where were they used? Pretty much everywhere, in radar, in microwave generators, receivers and transmitters, satellite communications. Thanks to their instantaneous switching, they were also used in ultrafast logic circuits. Well, the review is coming to an end. I deliberately didn't include vacuum tubes, since there are countless types and each one is unique in its own way. If you want, I can make a separate review about rare and interesting vacuum tubes. With that, all that's left is to say goodbye. As always, this was Kazyanov Ka with you, and until next time. Bye!